everybody. I think it's fair to say that this will be the best fireside we've had, certainly uh, this year, but potentially for the past uh, year and a half. I see Steve Quinnen is agreeing and Milton Little is as well. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Bernstein. I am in uh, Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada. We are very, very lucky to have uh, Dr. Milton Little, who is an orthopedic trauma surgeon at uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California, and Dr. Steve Quinnen, who's also an orthopedic trauma surgeon in uh, West Palm Beach at the Paley uh, Center. Both both of them are also very interested and experienced in post-traumatic limb reconstruction. So we're going to have a very good uh, session today about some of the nuances with uh, bone defects and some of the pearls and pitfalls. Next slide will be our disclosures. There are no relevant disclosures. I'm just kidding. There are a lot of disclosures here. Um, and those have been uh, resolved prior to uh, tonight's um, uh, fireside. Uh, AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society. We're dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. I think this fireside has been a really good uh, um, complement to that, uh, um, to, to our mission statement. Uh, we do not endorse or promote any use of products or service of commercial entities and the equipment used in this course for de demonstration teaching purposes only. Um, all your microphones have been muted. We encourage you to use the Q&A. We'll be multitasking as we discuss, argue uh, today, but uh, we'll also look at the Q&A to make sure we guide the discussion according to uh, what you guys want to hear, any questions or concerns you have. So we're going to end on time. We were joking before how to make sure we do that, but we'll go over some cases until... Um, about 8.55 p.m. Eastern time. And then there'll be a journal article to um, complement what we're talking about. And, and Dr. Little will, will discuss that. So we're gonna get right into it. Bone defects, a simple. Um, uh, Steve, we'll get right to the question. Um, is this, is this what, what do you think about this title? Bone defects and simple. <laughs> I would say that is a, uh, a slightly inaccurate uh, representation of the truth. Uh. <laughs> so, so Milton, so I wrote, I wrote this title. So times zero times one, T1, T0, T2. Um, do, do you separate that as you look into, you know, you, you both work at a, a level one trauma center and you also get a big referral practice. So does that make sense to you? It does. I mean, it, it, it definitely does. And I, I think that, you know, in the end, what we all know is that T0 is so critical that, you know, that really is the thing that leads to us dealing with situations in T2, uh, you know, in the end, it, it, it ends in us dealing with the more reconstructive component of things if T0 isn't handled correctly. Okay, so we're, we're going to go over some of these concepts in some acute trauma and post-traumatic reconstruction. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you should be able to identify key injury. We'll talk about key patient factors that help you decide uh, your limb salvage strategy, uh, current in, uh, initial management standards. And I wanna say like tonight is not about um, uh, fancy uh, post-traumatic bone defect uh, strategies. It's really about if you're either the uh, on-call surgeon or you are uh, the actual referral surgeon, uh, what pearls and pitfalls can we share and discuss about uh, some of these injuries? That, that can be very challenging. So I'm gonna have three cases of my own and then uh, Dr. Little has a case, Dr. Quinnen has a case and we'll, we'll try to talk about some of these different time points um, and see what we can uh, get out of it. So let's go to the first one. We're gonna ask, uh, let's say Dr. Little on this. This is a 23 year old uh, motorcycle injury. These are the X-fix x-rays you get the next morning, the next morning after your colleague was on call. So you're at sign out and uh, you're at a teaching institution, the residents 
present this case. So what, what are you guys discussing? I mean, the, the big questions I'm having are, what was the level of contamination for the case? Uh, how did the injury happen? Was it high energy? Was it low energy? Um, what was the environment where the injury occurred, right? Was this in a farm? Was it in water? Was it in, you know, was it, is it covered with road rash? I mean, I, I really want to know what the soft tissues look like, right? Given the, the level of comminution present, you know that it was a high energy injury, but you want to know what the environment was like for the patient because that's going to impact your thought process of, of your ability to get the region clean as well as uh, what the viability of the bone left behind is. Okay, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a closable wound. I just show a picture of, of the wound actually being closed. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys, when do you guys talk about social, uh, economic, education, family support? Is that, is that post-injury day one or when, when do you guys discuss that? I mean, those things come out in the presentation, right? So we, we meet with the residents every morning at 6.30. We run through every single console overnight. You know, they give the standard presentation. Where are they from? What do they do? Do they have a job? Do they use drugs? Are they alcoholics? Do they smoke cigarettes? Um, are we gonna be able to have adequate follow-up here? You know, all of those questions are discussed, you know, immediately upon presentation but also the next day when things are getting handed over. Steve, are you, um, so what's, what's your, you know, the case is put on the next day. What do you, what do you think and what are you doing? Yeah, so, I mean, I think uh, you guys hit on a lot of the highlights of questions that we would ask really early. Um, I think some of the other details about the situation, you know, um, what is the current status of the patient? How sick is the patient? You know, um, and 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 Milton really hit it right on the head. Soft tissue status, right? So we have a picture here. This is relatively favorable soft tissue status. What what worried me earlier is I saw a vac on top of there, and yeah. you know that that does bother me in the initial go, knowing that that's placed right over where the bone is, and if that was exposed bone in that area that's basically being left open to a contaminated field, that, that, would, that would be something I'd wanna get back on pretty quick. Um, here, if you've done a good debridement early, then um, with a closed soft tissue envelope, you, you have a little bit of flexibility in terms of your exact return to the OR, um, knowing what the muscle damage is. So that would be the, the next steps, right? So was there a crush component? Is the patient, uh, hemodynamically marginal. So those both of those contribute into the potential for a, an evolution of muscle damage as we go and would, would drive my uh, decision as to how quickly I need a return. You know, if somebody's uh, kind of marginal on pressors and had a bit of a crush injury, I want them probably back that very next day. Um, if somebody is, uh, you know, had a bad injury, but overall um, they're in pretty good shape hemodynamically, and uh, otherwise, um, you know, I might wait a couple days um, just to have it be the final thing and move on. Um, and then we want to go back and we want to take a good look and we just want to see, make sure anything that's, you know, dead muscle is no good. And mm -hmm. then I think we get to something that's a good point of conversation is, you know, these pieces of comminution and, you know, Juicy, juicy diaphyseal that. fragments. These are large diaphyseal fragments. So pitfalls here, Steve or Milton, pitfalls in the initial treatment with regards to, let's say, just let's run over fibula or if, I know we talk about fibula or if all the time, but give me practical pearls and pitfalls for all the people here and me. Fibula or if, um, and then diaphyseal chunks of bone like this? If you are not the definitive surgeon making final decisions, it is in your best interest to not fix the fibula in order and to stabilize things as much as possible. Additionally, for me, with even with diaphyseal fragments that may be devascularized at that first look, 
I would rather you leave them in if you're able to close the wounds so that I can make decisions kind of in the future, right? Because maybe I don't keep those pieces long-term, but those, may, those pieces may be extremely critical for me getting appropriate length alignment and rotation and doing my definitive fixation and possibly removing those fragments in the, at the end of my definitive fixation. Yeah, and I, I think that's all like very well said. Um, you know, I think there are different ways you can look at the fibula to stabilize it. And one of the one way that I often will throw in early on um, that I think is pretty simple is an intramedullary wire. I yeah. often just use, you know, a guide wire from a nail and just cut the tip off, shotgun it down, shotgun it up. That's pretty quick. It usually does a pretty good job getting it stable. You know, if you need to do something later to make it more perfect, it's good, but it does a great job in the temporizing of this kind of fracture, you know. Um, and then for the tibia, all, all those are totally valid. You know, having, having what's there is great. And there's, in my mind, there are two huge factors that determine for me what is going to be able to potentially stay in a given patient. Like these are big, juicy pieces. It's a big defect to take these out. So like, we're not really pumped about that if we don't feel the need to. So contamination matters to Milton's point about environment, right? If this is packed with cow dung or the patient fell down a sewer main for two hours versus if the patient, you know, they had, they had a car crash and they were in a seat belt and, and it's open, you know, but it's not covered in feces and uh, road grime. Totally, totally different scenarios, right? So those ones that were, you know, in a sense, high energy, but lower energy, I, I might keep all those things, even if they are actually devitalized, they may clean them real well and keep them. Um, and time is the, the other relevant factor. So the one is how many bacteria are in a race to contaminate that bone? And that's part one, how contaminated. Part two is how long did they have to run the race? Patients head injured, they don't get a proper debridement for three days. They came to me from St. Croix or God knows where on the planet and they haven't been debrided for three days. Bacteria have won the race on those devitalized pieces, yep. right? So, so those are kind of things I often add to the mix. So, so this, this patient was treated at another institution and within three, four days, the surgeon uh, removed uh, all, these, all these pieces and now sent to you, you're at day six. So um, this patient had, like you said, Steve, this patient ended up with a 14 and a half centimeter defect and just just to this point now, Steve, and 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 Milton's point about you know alignment, you know you're now at a point where the fibula is not fixed, the X fix is the same, but the this is removed. So can you just walk us through your your um, like how do you how do you audit or validate that you know the bone loss is what you know how how short or long the the like should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this case, I think the only way to get a really accurate read um, on the on the get go is to anatomically reduce and fix the fibula. Um, yep. If you do that, you get a pretty good read. Um, other than that, you, you probably want to have um, a little bit of flexibility in your game plan to be able to make up for any potential loss because it's going to be hard to be super accurate um, unless you got that fibula really spot on. Okay, so, so we, used, we used the contralateral leg for, you know, the five foot axis, radiographic ruler just to measure it mm -hmm. and, you know, geometric cuts and then set them up as a, a bone transport, but initially did a cement spacer IM nail and then he ended up getting a cable pulley transport. All right, next case. Um, <laughs> Simple. Next, you do that and it's well, over. You know, this, this case is good. This case is good because again, the, the, you're on call. Like this is not about, this is not a bone. Mm -hmm. Like we have those webinars, we have those courses and stuff. Yeah. So Milton, you're, you're on call. This is a very nice lady and she accidentally shot herself in the thigh Mm -hmm. um, so this is these are the only images we have and and so so pearls of you know 
skeletal stability, you know, the whole, you know, alignment situation, open wound, what, do you, what are your pearls here? I think the I think the the major pearl starts in the trauma bay, right? I think we have all been in the situation where you have a traumatized patient with a very very ugly limb that may be hemodynamically unstable, but if you place a tourniquet for a short period of time, you can get more information so that you can better attack this patient prior to entering the operating room. So I, I think, you know, for all of us, and these are conversations we have with our, our general surgeons kind of often, um, because we end up in this situation often, um, you get to the operating room without sufficient information, information that could have been garnered in a safe way. And so if you have the ability to have that conversation or be present in the trauma bay, that's gonna get you some information that may help you kind of moving into this situation. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. And then the second thing with just this information, obviously my plan is taking some images of the contralateral extremity, um, you know, obviously for rotation, uh, kind of trying to understand the nature of the injury, understand the, the rotation of the patient's contralateral leg. So I'm getting my lateral views of the knee uh, with AP views of the hip, as well as getting AP views of the knee and AP views of the hip uh, and looking at my, um, my lesser profiles, as well as looking at the lesser profiles in relation to that lateral view. So I'm going to be using all of those tools for my rotation. And then for my length, you know, radiographic ruler. Uh, the other thing that we have here at our institution is a thing called RadLink, uh, where you can do what we call pano, where you can get a three-point length view. Uh, so you can get a AP at the hip, AP at mid shaft, and an AP at the knee uh, with a radiographic ruler and then that can be stitched together and you can use that as a comparison for the contralateral side. Okay, and, and um, skeletal stability, Steve, here, are you doing? Um... Uh, it depends a little bit on the circumstances. You know, what is the patient's real hemodynamic status? Uh, you know, I see some staples up there. Are these guys doing some kind of uh, vascular bypass and things like that? You know, all that kind of plays in. Um, it, it's either going to be one of two things. It's either going to be an X fix or it's going to be some kind of uh, very provisional intramedullary fixation. Okay. And um, when, when do you, is a cement spacer like, that's is that what we're, we're all doing is that standard for for like the initial t1 let's say so t0 let's say is the vascular repair skeletal traction or x fix mm -hmm. t1 is is i am male cement spacer that would probably be my t1 yep i think that that t0 i might put beads in instead of a spacer but you know whatever something like that and then t t1 would be nail spacer Okay, so um, sort of what we we're talking about before, and then this is, is this a bit snobby, this piriformis entry nail, is that, uh, is that Bob, is that? Depends important? on where the fracture is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a, a subtrope, sub effectively, sub effectively a subtrope enteric. So is, is troke entry nail different for you than a piriformis? Is that important for you? It's a whole lot easier to get a consistent, reliable result with a piriformis nail in that fracture. Yeah, okay. I agree. and then bone loss assessment. How are you guys uh, doing that? So, you know, for me, as I mentioned, I'm doing it based on my my in intra op panel views as well as my you know the uh, radiographic ruler. Okay. The other thing that I will do um, with some of these patients, oftentimes with these polytraumas, you'll have a full CT scanogram. Uh, 
And if you look at the scalp views, that will give you a, a pretty good predictor of your length. And if you find your start point and your predicted end point on the contralateral limb, uh, that will also give you an idea of where your nail is uh, going to be ending and kind of your length for your nail. A question yeah, about um, ballistic injuries in bones. I mean, you know, I showed that there is a, a fracture line that propagated distally. Um, do you guys, any other pearls about, you know, they talked about um, CT of the femoral neck to make sure there's no propagation up. Any other things you want to look for? Is that common you see these in these high energy ballistic injuries, these fracture lines that are non-contiguous? It's fairly common. Yeah, you do see it often. And, and, and I think uh, you're right, you know, you got to look for those things. Um, they, they certainly can affect uh, your overall strategy and management, how easy it is to get it right. Um, and, and one thing I would mention about what Milton had said about using the radiographic ruler, um, an important thing that is, uh, if you've done it a lot, obvious, and if you haven't, maybe not, is that that radiographic ruler is terrible at giving you an accurate measurement of what the actual number of millimeters is that you're measuring. Yep. What's really critical to try to get the legs as close as you can using that method is to use put it in the same location on each leg so that the x-ray projection on both sides is giving you the same projection because you're not going to get an exact measure from an ephemeral ruler on the front of the thigh what you're looking to do is try to match the reading from the one side being put in the same place on the thigh as you are the other. Um, so that's one of the one of the key pearls about using that device for measuring. Um, and I have to say that I, I think I'm okay at it, but um, I, I, and I think I'm not alone in saying that it's really hard to be super precise with these really exploded femurs. And, you know, I, I don't take it as a, uh, a personal failure if on that first go, my length is a little bit off. Um, in these cases, this is not going to be a one and done. So I certainly would, um, you know, plan to get post-op images that will represent what the contralateral length is. And at that point, you have a locking screw mark that you can use as a pretty accurate read to make sure you get it right when you go back for, for part two. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Raul Vadia once told me, you know, we, we gave up on making them perfect. I just put in the put in the screw and, and we measure it. And if it's off, I know exactly how much and I just change locking screws and that's my second case and it's perfect. Um, so they, they get a lot of gunshot wounds. But that's kind of a food for thought on these that, you know, if it isn't perfect, just make sure you check it in a way that's real accurate. And if you need it, if you need to adjust it, you can. Okay, there is a question about uh, use of interlock bolts. I don't really I, uh, understand the question. If, if you can retype it again, I don't know if Milton or uh, Steve can take a look also. Uh, how do you plan for use of interlock bolts or other fixation with respect to nail diameter bolt number? You save bone for later, next steps for teeth. Oh, uh, you know, I think in some of those situations where you really are concerned about your ability, you know, as, you know, as Steve just said, instead of putting two interlocks, place one interlock, right. knowing that, that you can change it if necessary and not, you know, not burning any bridges. Um, I tend to go bigger with my nail diameters with retrograde than I do with anagrade, um, especially if the defects we're talking about are distal, uh, just to fill up more uh, of that void. Um, otherwise, I look for good is isthmus fit, fit in terms of nail diameter. And I think if I understand the question correctly, I don't ream, you know, I do think it's a very good question in that I'm not sure yet what the final management of this patient is. So you can see here, I don't have geometric flat cuts. This could be some sort of bone grafting strategy. I also, there, there is probably a non-union at one point coming down the road that may need an exchange nailing with a larger nail. So back to that question, 
I don't use the largest nail. I try to use the 10 ish always uh, nail. Um, and, and so, so at this point, we're sort of set up for, for the reconstruction here. Steve, what are your, what are your, any comment about uh, at this point? So now you're like T3 referred to you. Uh, what are you thinking about strategies? Oh, there's one other, there's one other question just here. I'll, we'll answer it live. It was, the question was, why don't you use X fix as damage control first? And I think we all kind of agreed that our first step would probably be X fix just for stabilization of things. There may be some augmentation somewhere, but most likely X fix uh, for that first stage. So yeah. And I think, I think it's, things. I think that's a great point. And just to be clear, this T zero management was an X fix. And, and I think like, I mean, there's a distal femur fracture here. That's pretty scary. Yeah. So this T0 was an X fix, and then T1 was converted um, to, to this. This was, let's say, within seven days, but T0 was an X fix. Yeah, most of these ones like this, like sort of an upper shaft, large bone loss from a gunshot, that patient's going to be hemodynamically stable like 99 times out of 100. So I think this case almost always would get an X fix just based on that alone, at least in my hands. <laughs> so what, what about next steps, Steve? What are you doing for definitive, uh, yeah, are you so doing I above think... knee amputation or limb salvage here? <laughs> well, if the patient has a, you know, a vascularized foot and functioning nerves and uh, all that kind of stuff, I think it's pretty clear that we would do limb salvage here. Um, you know, uh, so I think this one does give you a lot of options for how you could approach the bone loss reconstruction. You know, it, it certainly is one, uh, you know, it's in a femur. Um, uh, I think bone grafting it is certainly an option, uh, sort of masculine or, you know, uh, induced membrane style, uh, certainly reasonable. Um, it's a good size defect. So, uh, you know, the bigger that they kind of get, the, the more that's a little bit uh, difficult to get to work sometimes, but it's kind of in that zone still. Um, you certainly have a couple ways of transport. I, I, I would probably not use an X fix, but uh, something all internal. If I had a bone transport nail option, I think that'd be perfectly good. If I, if I didn't, then uh, I think uh, a PAPS kind of thing could work. So it'd probably be between those three for me. It's a femur. Um, and I think all three of those could work. So paps it is. <laughs> paps it is. And uh, I think it's important also to recognize that you could have talked a lot more about the strategies because there are multiple strategies within these these you know, we didn't even hear Milton's comments about what he would do. So there's obviously multiple ways to do it. This is just one way. It is not the right way. Uh, and then the idea here uh, with this with this fireside is really to, to argue about some of the pearls pitfalls about the initial management. And then the reconstruction at T3, T4 is, is you know, is fun. But the challenging part is the beginning, the setup. And I think all of us... Um, need to be aware of how to how to manage that. Okay, so we have uh, one last case and we're gonna move on to yours. This is a 29 year old, she had an open uh, 3A distal femur, huge, huge degloving injury, uh, fairly simple bone uh, injury, uh, had an IM nail initially um, that was done. And then seven months post-op uh, was referred on to me with, with this image, this x-ray, broken screws, a draining pus. Um, <laughs> Milton's shaking and said yes. So I'll just fast forward to this slide. Um, do, you, do you guys use this to, to, again, I mean, we sort of mentioned it. If you have the ability to get a standing hip to ankle to check lengths, uh, do you guys use this routinely? I do. All the time. Okay. And then... So I think this is a good point, really. You wanna check how the femur was nailed. So we're gonna fast forward to the end and then go backwards, sort of like the contrast with the first case. So when I went in, these pieces of bone were loose and, and just infected. Any, any 
issues from the initial injury that you can predict this or you just can't predict that? I think that's the, right? That's the same thing that, that we were talking about. You know, sometimes we, sometimes if you have a good soft tissue envelope or you feel like it's not that contaminated, there are pieces that you may maintain. And I think this was one of those situations where, where they definitely were more stripped than they expected them to be. And I think they, they, they did it with hope of this, you know, hope of these bones surviving and they did not. Yeah, it really looks like looking at those soft tissues, boy, it sure looks like that was a pretty extensive wound that had a yeah. uh, pretty high risk for, for this with devitalized pieces in there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the um, number one, I just wanna say, if, there, if there's any issue hearing us, or following the slides, please let us know. The name of the technique that we showed was, uh, Steve talked about it, it was called uh, P-A-B-S-T, Plate Assisted Bone Transport. It's an all internal type of technique. Uh, again, using the Elizarov science, the Elizarov method, but just different tools to do that. This is distraction osteogenesis using a different uh, vehicle. So, um, so that patient got the same sort of treatment, again, hardware removal, new IM nail, antibiotic coated with a cement spacer. So now you're at like, you know, T three and a half, and then, um, and then had the same sort of anti-grade plate assisted bone transport right now, given the current uh, market. She actually had a bone grafting initially and the bone just disappeared so this is like T6 strategy to get the um, uh, plate assisted bone transport. I'm going to hand it off to Milton at this point. Um, and there was a question about letting patients weight bear. I let patients weight bear on the uh, reconstruction nail with a cement spacer, but not weight bearing with a plate assisted bone transport. All right, Milton, I'm going to give you control. Okay. Has there been any, uh, the other question, there was one, another question about the sound from that person. Is it improving or what, what's going on from a sound standpoint? So, all right. All right, looks like I have control. So this is a 49 year old smoker. Uh, he had an infected distal tibial non-union. Uh, he is about 10 months post uh, his initial surgery. He, the injury happened when he was climbing into a hot tub, uh, when he slipped and fell and had this open injury. He had undergone operative fixation and then had multiple sinuses, which continued to drain for prolonged periods of time. Uh, eventually requiring him to undergo hardware removal. And this is how he presented to my office. So I guess Mitch or Steve. Yeah, go ahead, Mitch. Um, so what, what do you want me to talk about here? I guess for you, when you, when you get to this point, right, when, when you get the patient who has had, you know, similar to the one you just had, who has a course where it sounds like there may have been some putting the head in the sand for periods of time with draining wounds, and, and now you have a non-union, you have pain, and you have somebody who is young, who is trying to kind of return to their previous level of function, how do you discuss, you know, how do you start this conversation? So I think it's a nice contrast because here we're at a clinic or an office setting. So you can spend, you can spend half an hour with the patient. Um, <clears throat> the things I'm just thinking on top of my head is below knee amputation. I'll mention that to the patient, of course, 
And I say, you know, I think all three of us are limb, limb reconstruction, uh, I'm not gonna say experts, but passionate at limb reconstruction. So we're not conflicted. You know, we would love to do limb salvage, but I'd say, you know, baloney amputation is a great option just to see how they react and also to make sure they understand the, the significance of the injury. The soft tissue we talked about that dictates everything we do. So is there a flap? Are there just skin incisions and or is anything actively draining? And then of course, it's what is the ankle joint? Is this a limb salvage, ankle fusion, limb salvage, ankle salvage? And then that sort of breaks me off into uh, strategy. And then I don't know yet, I don't know if Steve can answer here is, how do you know, Steve, if this is a bone defect or like a bone grafting? Uh, case. Can you yeah, tell that here, Steve? It's it's tough to say at this point in time without a little more information, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, in the office, he had had a little kind of collection along the anterior lateral aspect around one of those sinuses. So kind of that deep collection was aspirated and sent off. And that had a positive, you know, positive gram stain and growth of bacteria uh, after fi finding, after kind of getting our final results of that, as well as him having elevated inflammatory markers, uh, ESR and CRP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I mean, you know, at this point, uh, I think there's a couple things, you know, kind of leaning toward this being a big issue when you look at those x-rays um, that kind of hint us there. I mean, first, you know, there was clearly a plate there for a while and it sounds like the infection happened early. So um, when that happens, we, we typically do have a cortex at risk underneath at a minimum um, where that plate was, you know, so that's something, something I think I would keep in mind looking at it. Um, the other thing is if you look at the medial side of the bone and maybe even the lateral side climbing up there, there is uh, a little bit of in involucrum, uh, which is which is there, and I think that that sign uh, is significant. Um, if there's involucrum climbing up the bone to a certain level, um, it is not infrequent that that portion of bone is not viable. So when I look at this, I am getting a hint that that distal spike may be big trouble, and um, it is the most likely to have been a problem because that spike is what pops out the skin and sticks into the dirt, you know? Yeah. So, so I am concerned looking at these x-rays that I see signs that make me say, um, there's a good chance that the culprit is that spike. And that is a good chance that that goes up to the top of the involucrum where I'm, I'm, it's a, there's a decent chance that whole, that whole segment's bad. Um, the distal thing, looks like it probably is okay, except maybe very medially um, where the plate was. I'd look real careful at that because underneath where the plate was, that might be a little dicey. That'd be the, the signs in this that I was looking at but when I, when I pre-op assessed it. Um, I do think sometimes that getting an MRI is helpful for guiding what might happen. But at the end of the day, it probably doesn't make a difference when I get to the operating room and what ends up happening. So it makes me feel better. And I counsel the patient probably a little more accurately, but I don't know if it matters. I mean, you guys have thoughts on that one? On the MRI? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, I think it does. It, it gives me more information. I think it does help me to understand, you know, at least some of the proximal extent to the infection. Um, but, you know, I think the one thing that, I think of it about it almost as if it's like a tumor, right? We, you know, you may have an MRI that shows that there's no infection. Can you guys see my arrow? Uh, probably, yes. yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you may say that the infection stops just at that little wafer of, at the most proximal aspect of that distal spike. But I think I'm, you know, if I'm planning on taking any of that bone, I'm still going to be even more aggressive than that. Um, do you, so, do you, is this also a bit, uh, I don't know if the word is, uh, 
silly or too cute? Do you make the distinction between infected bone and non-viable bone as you do your debridement? I do. Yeah, I think that is, I think that's a critical component, right? Because non-viable bone is probably not going to be very successful if you're planning to do any kind of transport or docking. It likely may not be successful even if you're trying some kind of mask allay or additional right. bone grafting technique. Yeah, you know, vascularized bone, even if it's contaminated, it can protect itself to some degree. Um, dead bone just can't. It can never win. So there is definitely a difference there. Milton, there's a question. Do you have any, sorry, Milton, do you have any, you don't have any clinical photos of this patient's ankle? No, I don't. His, yeah. I have post, but his, um, you know, the big things about his ankle were that his ankle, actually, all of the other skin looks supple. Um, it actually looks very healthy. The lateral side, he has an anterior lateral incision as well as a lateral, a direct lateral incision. And then he has a couple small poke hole sinuses in between the two. All right. So the other big point of information for him uh, was the fact that he lives in Mexico. So he's visiting and he's planning to go back and forth. And so I think that had a huge component uh, to kind of thought process. And, you know, here you can see his CT scan showing that it just, it's just outside the joint. So it's just extra articular, but you can see he has that involucrum that, that Steve was talking about. Um, and so we kind of had to discuss, we had some decision-making to make. And so as Mitch talked about, I mentioned amputation to him. Uh, the other option we discussed uh, was the idea of a kind of fusion. Uh, so meaning removing all of the bone and fusing the ankle joint. Um, and then lastly would be some kind of transport, whether with a frame or with, at the time, uh, the all internal transport nail. And he was very keen on the idea of the transport nail, uh, especially given the fact that he lived in Mexico and would be traveling back and forth. And that the idea of sending somebody home with a frame, sending somebody far away with a frame did not seem like a viable option. Unfortunately, uh, the transport nail went off of, um, it went off the market after we discussed things. And, you know, as you look, we kind of started to evaluate what our options were. So, you know, we thought we had about three centimeters of, of kind of anterior cortex, about 16 milli, like, you know, about 1.6 centimeters of medial cortex. Uh, you can see that he's falling into varus a little bit. And we knew that there would be a large void. But, you know, thinking about those options, the things that came to mind for me um, was something that would provide him with an all internal option and basically going in and cutting out all of the dead bone. Um, placing a cement spacer, placing him in an X-fix, and then having my plastics colleagues uh, perform a flap uh, so that we can control uh, his soft tissues, you know, as our first stage. Okay, we, we, only, have, we only have three minutes for your case, yeah. but I'm going to ask a question that's going to take 45 minutes to answer. <laughs> Do you think we have too many, I'm not going to swear, fill in the blank, options? Do you think we have too many options, like, like, right? No, you have to have this many options, right? If I ask, if I show this image and I just talk about him as a person, and then I say it, most people are going to say probably some form of fusion and transport because masculine doesn't really work as well in the distal tibia, right? All right. And so if once that transport nail was gone, the other option is plate assisted bone transport. Um, for him. But the thing that even for that, I would still need a frame. And so that was still something that was worrisome for me. And so for me, my thought was a combination of nail plate and mask allay, because I think every single patient is going to be different. And you're, you're going to need all of those options, you know, and being able to have those options, you know, if there's something that's going to be out of the box for me, 
I know that I have a partner who I may be able to send the patient to, who it may be a better thing for him, or we may do a combined case together. Um, but I think having those options are critical. Okay. I mean, I, I think to a large degree, you're absolutely right. The tools are critical because patients that are unable to uh, follow directions and patients that are unable to uh, maintain follow-up for things that need uh, real monitoring. Um, I mean, even if one option might have some advantages in the healing, sometimes you need those other options. They're going to be better for that patient. As Mitch says, a sophisticated treatment for a sophisticated patient. So Lizarov apparently said <laughs> that. Case T, uh, Milden, I'm going to ask you a question as you show this. Yep. Uh, when resecting bone, this is a question from the audience. When resecting bone, do you remove bone until you see bleeding bone? Again, talk to us practical, practical. How do you debride bone? I do. I, I, I removed it until I saw bleeding bone. I reamed out the proximal and distal canal. Um, and I was a little, because he was very adamant about maintaining his ankle joint motion, um, I was, I tried to be a little, a little more salvage, salvaging at the distal end, but also because I knew I needed at least one to two interlocks for that distal segment to combine with the plate to provide stability for him. I, I, I needed to keep a little bit more bone. Okay, next question for you and Steve. Um, determining if infection is cleared, are you, how, how are you doing that? Mm -hmm. Or are you doing that? I have to say, I'll just answer it because I, even though I asked you, I'm going to answer it myself. I, I find myself almost like super aggressive on the front end. And then I almost forget about the infection. Like I don't do six, I don't do new cultures typically. And I think I'm being a little bit obnoxious about it. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I, I will, I will typically send a new culture. Um, but I don't do an extra trip to the OR to do it. I just send it on the stage um, reconstruction and it just guides whether I give additional antibiotics typically. Um, and, and I, but I do, I do typically check like an ESR and CRP, but to be quite frank, I think once you've done your initial debridement and stuff, they're probably pretty low yield to really tell you much. So, you know, Clinically, it gives you a whole lot of advice is my, my idea. And I, I, I do take them and, and just for the sake of the fact that if they are positive, I'm going to treat them just based on the, the, the work looking at incidental findings uh, with positive cultures because I'll be aggressive and treat them. Um, but I won't, you know, I won't hold them in the hospital for the treatment. I won't um, send them home prophylactically on anything. I will treat them if anything comes back after the fact. Okay, you're minus 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, last question though, last question though. For, for debriding using reamers, you guys use reamers or RIA? RIA for intramedullary. RIA okay. for intramedullary. Thank you. Okay, Milton, you have uh, minus 40 seconds. All right, there's the flap opened. There's our plate in position. Let's see if this moves a little quick. It's stalling a little bit. I got you. I got you, Milton. I got yep. you. All right. Why don't you go ahead and advance? So really getting my start point, we used the opposite side for appropriate measurement. Um, getting my appropriate endpoint was really critical. Uh, getting my nail down and getting it dis extremely distal so I can this is this I'm shaking my head because you've also given talks on extreme nailing this guy by the way audience members Dr. Milton Little is the is the king on extreme nailing I have never seen <laughs> these more extreme than this okay keep going Milton um and you know wanting to get down and I used angular stable screws for this one uh placed our plate and then filled our void uh, with the large, with bone graft, I used um, iliac crest reaming uh, for my bone graft, as well as cancellous chips, and started him walking on it. And, you know, at nine months, he came in, and you can see he's incompletely healed. It's probably a implant, uh, de <coughs> implant dependent union, um, but he's happy. He's doing the things he wants to do. 
He has a nice track suit um, and he's living his life. Beautiful. All right, Steve, you're taking us home. I'm gonna stop Milton, give you control and uh, we're gonna move to your what case. We got here. Good, yeah, so, so it's interesting. We kind of closed out with a couple infection cases that you know, harken back uh, a little bit to the, the beginning of our talk in terms of what the consequences are. So um, this guy here, he's a 43 year old guy. He was actually a police officer, uh, you know, down in the Caribbean and he got shot. Uh, ended up with open fractures and uh, was basically treated with plates and screws, uh, as you see here. Uh, he's 15 months out, you know, he's not healed, as you can see up there in the upper shaft. And, you know, his labs are a little bit high. He had a history of some drainage a while ago that's not 100% clear, but certainly something telling us something went on. Um, but at present, you know, he's He's a little swollen. He's a little warm. There's no obvious collections, but we have uh, definitely some things pointing us uh, in a direction. Um, Milton, what do you think? What are your, some of your thoughts here early on? You know, I, I think it's it's we've run into that same situation before, right? You're you're trying to decide which what bone is viable, um, and you know what cortex is viable. What is our soft tissue envelope going to look like? Um, you know, thankfully, the, th those incisions are all on the lateral side uh, where you do have some muscle, you know, muscle present. So hopefully there may be, you know, from a flap coverage standpoint, you may have an easier time of covering things. Um, and then obvious, the obvious deformity that's present. Um, would, you say, would you say here, I mean, I'm looking at this, would you say a pitfall here is is not being emotionally prepared to resect uh, a segment? I mean, right? We got to cut to the chase here. Is oh, yeah. that is that a pitfall here? And if you're not prepared to do that, like, what are you suggesting? Send it to to South Florida, East Coast. <laughs> I think you have to be. I had you have to be ready. You have to be ready to do it. And and if you aren't ready to do it, or you don't have a method of fixing it, then yes, you send it to South Florida. You send it to the correct person. <laughs> but but again, for the webinar, but seriously for the webinar, you could you could resect cement space and some form of skeletal stability, whether it's an extra or not, and then refer to a colleague, right? If you if you have the interest or you you know there's a need to manage this acutely, right? At times four or whatever. But I think but I, but at this time, unless the patient is septic, if you have a contact who you can get them to quickly, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's similar to kind of the biopsy situation when you're an oncologist. I really would prefer to do, you know, you, you, as the oncologist, you prefer to do the biopsy yourself so that no one, you know, clips your wings or, or cuts you out at the knees. Yeah, it is. It probably does save a procedure, you know, because at most people will be, unless you know the person who did the resection and things well, and you know their practice and they're very familiar to you, um, you're probably going to want to do an exploratory look, yeah, even if you end up liking it. So probably if the resection's done elsewhere, um, it probably bites off another procedure for me just because I need to see it myself and make sure it's okay, to Milton's point. I don't think it's wrong to take out infected stuff, but if you're not going to do the definitive reconstruction and the patient's not really sick, I, I agree. I think it's a better strategy. I mean, and maybe if you're going to remove the plate and place them in an X fix, I think that's, I think that's not unreasonable. But once you once they start resecting bone, it, it becomes problematic. So I guess, Mitch, what do you think? You know, we got all these pieces in here and you mentioned taking them all out. I mean, what, what makes you think we need to go that way necessarily just looking at the picture? Um, 
the the history open fracture the fact that it's 15 months out so there's enough time for the bone to to like you know the case that i showed the the femur was a sort of simple femur fracture and then seven months later it declares itself on the imaging so you you have that that uh, periosteal reaction that is not necessarily specific to infection but in this case i would say is and again, I'm thinking that there's going to be a nose, a nice bone segment that almost just comes off with your hand and even taking out that lag screw, that piece is going to be out. And then you're, you're thinking again, am I doing a geometric cut here or is this a, you know, an asymmetric uh, inducible membrane uh, yeah. technique, but, but it looks it, it, just by the flavor of it, you know, mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that I think this one sort of emphasizes, you know, on that initial debridement, when you do decide to keep pieces of comminution, you know, and, and that can be okay to do if they are pretty good and stuff. But, but it does usually mean that, especially with the plate, that if things go a little south and there's an infection, usually that area of comminution, you're biting off the whole thing is a problem. Most of the time, it's all going to end up being... Uh, secondary, it'll, it'll end up, you know, being devitalized and it probably is involved. So looking at it, I think it gives you a little hint there. You can see where that comminution was, you know. Uh, we're going to um, go, we're going to go live to questions, Steve, to interrupt you. And then yeah. uh, we're going to derail you. So let's say you're using an antibiotic coated rod. There's a question. Give us some quick tips on size, chest tubes versus nail. I mean, that's a whole talk, but I guess you have 20 <laughs> seconds, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. I guess it depends on how big the canal is, first of all, uh, because you need to be able to fit the size of the nail in. And you'd really like to have a decent mantle or else it's very likely that it is going to, uh, you know, basically come off as you come out. So um, I'll either use sort of an 859 nail or I'll use a 10. Note that the cement does nothing for the mechanical stability of the nail. So if you're if you're using a small nail, you're getting the stability of the small nail. Um, so typically, if you can do a ten and you can kind of have a twelve five outer diameter for the um, cement, that's a pretty good combo. But it depends on the size of the canal. Thoughts? Okay, I agree. <laughs> Milton, next question going to you. Um, bone grafting mm -hmm. uh even the 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 person asking says it's a bit outside the scope of the talk but you also have 20 seconds your preferred um preferred bone graft mm -hmm. for for defects if someone's been not if someone's if we've already been through the knee and they've been non-weight bearing on the side for a prolonged period of time I'm a little reluctant to do rehab because oftentimes you won't get as much bone as you think. Uh, so oftentimes I will use iliac crest um, reaming. So I'll use an acetabular reaming, reamer, um, peel down the outer table and make sure that I don't uh, perforate the inner table. Start with a 36 reamer and up to about a 40 reamer. And you can get a very good slurry of cortical cancellous bone and then I usually mix that with cancellous chips. So that's my go-to for someone who has been non-weight bearing on an extremity, and I'm worried that I'm not gonna get enough uh, actual sub substantive rhea uh, reaming. If they've been weight bearing on that side, you know, it's a tibia, then I don't think it's unreasonable to use, uh, use the, to go through the knee in retrograde uh, or integrate and, and use a RIA for that. Um, there's a question about the patient lives on skid row. What does skid row mean? In jail, what does skid row mean? Skid row is a place in, in Los Angeles or wherever you want to call it, where there are people with no homes, where houseless folks may live okay. and you live in the streets. Okay, so 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 you know, a practical question, and and so you talked about how you you tailor your treatment. So you know, Steve used to work in Miami. Um, did you did you tailor your treatment differently 
do, do you, you know, how, how does that personally affect your decision? Are you biased? Do you find you're conflicted? Do you care? 20 seconds, 15 seconds. You have yeah, five I seconds. Thought, I, I would say in Miami, I definitely, um, I still went with, uh, with transport and, and more, com more complex techniques, even when um, I had patients that it was a bit more of a challenge in. There were a few that were over the top that we would alternate, uh, go with alternates. Um, skid row is not necessarily a bad thing for a frame because they make way more money panhandling. So they're pretty happy about that. Um, but you know, uh, it, it is more of a challenge. Okay. All right. Let's continue. Steve, you have uh, a couple minutes. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll make it quick then. Let's see here. Actually, it's not advancing for me for some reason. Can you get it to advance, Mitch? I certainly can. Hold on, I'm gonna to try to, okay, I'll advance for you, not a problem. All right, so we did exactly what you said and it was the area we thought, um, the area comminution pretty much was the culprit. Um, and it did culture positive for MSSA. So not a super aggressive bug, but enough to be a problem. Um, the fibula didn't was benign. We took the plate out, but there was nothing over there. Um, so we could kind of go to the next one there, I think, real quick, since we're running low. And we took a little bit different of attack. You know, um, we uh, we did stage it uh, on the last one. Uh, made sure that we uh, gave a course of antibiotics. I can't remember if we only waited two weeks or six. I, I don't always wait a full course, uh, but I like them to get at least a week or two. Uh, of antibiotics before we start. Um, but if we're, if we're using this, it's pretty low uh, impact in terms of hardware. It can be a quick turnaround. Um, this is basically a cable transport frame. So it's one method of using an X fix to transport uh, bone and it's distal to proximal, um, relatively smaller segment, which I think helps prevent contractures, but that's a side point. Uh, anyway, we move on. And uh, basically when it's complete, we believe that we've healed the infection. Uh, we converted that to an intramedullary nail. Uh, and you see here, it's a, a little bit of a ghostly bone. It does have that antibiotic cement coat. Um, and that's probably a 10 millimeter nail with uh, a 12, seven outer diameter. And uh, we went ahead and watched that sucker after a couple of months, you start to see it show up. And then one more, um, we get a good healing of everything there. Um, so anyway, that's just an alternative way that we can address the bone loss. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, back to the principles, the key, the key really is, you know, making sure that you get rid of where these bacteria are harbored and what we do on day one, I think in this case, you really see like the parts that we kept that were the risky parts when it went bad, we had to address all of them, you know? So, so there's a question about that, Steve. So like, you know, you, you, you have this x-ray, this patient, and then you go to, to this, right? You have, you have no surface implant, no IM nail, but you made the decision for a, a, a bone transport. And like we said, there's like 16 versions of it now. So the question from one of the, one of the participants is bone resection and definitive management always staged or do you do you can you do it in the same uh session well so you absolutely can do it in the same session um the caveat to that is you do have to feel confident that you have eradicated the infection so in this case there was a pretty high probability that i had eliminated it with the debridement alone uh, my only hesitation in that on this case was the area under the plate on the lateral side. Um, and because I did debride it, but it's harder, I didn't take out that whole cortex. So I, it was harder for me to be 100% certain that without getting a little course of antibiotics, I had really knocked it down. Um, if it weren't for that, I would have done this one in one stage. And I think if you are confident that your debridement has eliminated the section, I think there's no problem with doing it in one stage. Okay, next question, a quick one. What happened to the docking site? Did it fully heal? Did you have to do any secondary procedures? It, it did, it did eventually heal. 
Um, I did go back and I uh, roughened it up and add a little bone graft. I think this was probably, um, this was roughly like 11 months. Um, I went back and I added a little bit and within a couple of months it healed. Uh, but I did actually have to do something on, uh, on this one to get it to finish healing. It had like a partial <clears throat> use in there. Milton, are you, are you, besides antibiotic impregnated cement, mm -hmm. anything else locally for, for uh, infection? If I'm Generally trying speaking. to have a void, um, that's, that's my go-to, right? If I'm trying to make, if I'm trying to make a mascalay, you know, if I'm trying to have a membrane for a mascalay or, you know, that's usually my go-to. Occasionally I will do stimulant beads. Um, you know, if it's a situation where I'm not going back uh, or if it's just a soft tissue void and my plastic surgeons are covering it, I may leave stim stimulant beads behind. Um, and then sometimes in those patients who come in who have a non-union that doesn't necessarily fit all the criteria of being infected, but may be questionable, or you're taking out an antibiotic rod, one option is to inject um, stimulant, which is a calcium sulfate, uh, uh, wet, so a little bit wetter into the canal before inserting my nail as a, as a method of some prophylactic antibiotic coverage. Oh, it's on mute. Uh, Teriparatide. I believe that's the PTH analog. Correct. Any any use okay. in these? Yeah. Any use here, guys? <clears throat> any experience? Um, yeah, I've had a, more than a handful of them that are on it. Honestly, I think it's a great medicine. Yeah. I think it makes total biological sense. And anecdotally, in, I don't know, somewhere between eight or 10 cases I've had that patients were on it. Um, it, it did seem to help. We have absolutely zero data to support it, but um, I'm all for it. If you can get it approved, it's not easy to get the insurers to pay for it. Yeah. There's, I mean, there, you know, HealthFit has the proximal femur, um, proximal femoral non-unions uh, treated with blades, additional augmentative plating, as well as for tail use showing improved healing, you know, a very high healing rate. Uh, so I have a low threshold for for trying to get it used. the the biggest The biggest impediment, as Steve mentioned, is the cost and whether it's going to be approved. Um, quick, quick pearl, Steve, for plate assisted bone transport in the femur. The the nail that is used is straight. The femur is curved. If you're using a plate assisted bone transport, most of the new plates have a femoral bow in it. Is there an issue with uh, aligning segments there? Um, I mean, that doesn't necessarily work against you because um, so you're going to do an osteotomy. So if you do the osteotomy before you place the nail, then you're going to you're going to be able to typically accommodate the straightness of the nail better. And the, the curvature of the plate may be helpful in the sense that you need screws that avoid the nail. So typically you'll have some offset holes that can help you. Um, it, it is important though, I would say, uh, to recognize that um, in the femur especially, that maintaining your alignment during uh, a plate assisted nailing can be difficult. The forces are really strong. Uh, for the plate. So you have to watch that pretty carefully. And depending on exactly the details of how it was done, um, you, you may need to convert that to um, your trauma nail once the transport's complete, uh, if you want to really get the uh, alignment sort of square on. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about bone alive granules? I do not even know. I don't know what bone alive is. Steve does. Yeah, it's bioglass. Um, it's good. It's, uh, I think it's very helpful. It's, uh, so it's, it's really new here in the US, but they've been using it in Europe for a long time. 
Um, the bioglass has, uh, you know, a very negative charge, basic uh, pH, uh, which is generally favorable for infection control. Um, and there's, there's a good amount of data that uh, without antibiotics, it is a helpful antibacterial that you can add. Uh, and it is also bone forming. Um, it's a little different to work with because it literally is like glass. Um, and it, so, so it's not quite the same as most of the bone cements. Um, but I, I do think it has a role that here in the US, we're just starting to explore, but there's good data for it in Europe. Okay, we're almost done here. We have a couple more minutes. Milton, last question. This is from uh, an hour and a half ago by one of the participants. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Primary closure, Milton. How do you uh, quick pearls on, you know, a T0, T1? Or, are you, you know, is that very important for you? How do you decide primary closure or not? You know, it, it's, it goes back to all of those questions we had before, you know, the level of comminution or not comminution, but the level of contamination. Um, you know, things that are relatively clean injuries, I think primary closure is my, my way to go uh, when I can. I oftentimes will use Algauer uh, Donati suture technique uh, in a uh, sequential fashion for closure. If things are looking like they are extremely tight and it's gonna be, I am really gonna be fighting to close it, I will not close it in that situation um, and I will avoid it, uh, you know, there are going to be situations where I think I can get a safe, clean debridement and definitive fixation, either on a medial side or somewhere where you don't have a lot of soft tissue management. And in those situations, I will really lean into it to avoid going back into that injury, uh, into that injured skin and running the risk of having the soft tissues uh, unable to be closed in the future. So that's... That's my, my, my gist on primary closure. Okay, um, thank you. I have to say I very, we're almost done. Uh, sadly, I, I really enjoy speaking to both of you. And I think this, this fireside is, is the best one because <laughs> it's, I mean, come on, jokes aside, it's clearly the best one because I think we're really trying to focus and hit on these principles at the beginning that are applicable to all of us, uh, depending on, you know, independent on where you work, you, you focus on patient factors. And I think we talked about how that really can, can guide your reconstructive approach. We talked about injury and patient factors, uh, I think in detail. And then of course your institutional and surgical limitations, if any, you know, you may not have any, you may have a lot of options and, and you may have some. Um, whether that's patient or, or some technical skills or uh, experience that you may have. And then soft tissue management at all stages. I think we've repeated that multiple times. Uh, I think that's really critical. So I'm going to hand it over to Milton for a couple minutes, and then I'll just uh, show a couple slides at the end. I think, I think this journal article is awesome. I think it's really helpful. Uh, so we can top you know, talking randomly and talk a little bit more science about uh, critical bone defects. Go ahead, Milton. Yeah, and I, and I think, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit at the end, um, but this is from the 2015 uh, Bossy article looking at defining what the lower limit of, of critical bone defects were in open diaphyseal tibial fractures. And I, I think it it does speak to this article, but I, I think one of the things it speaks to the most is kind of that initial decision making of removing bone, um, making a decision whether we're going to consider clean cuts and transport from jump, and how to really think about these patients when they initially present to you. Um, so, you know, the, the whole purpose of the article initially, you know, it talks about the idea that what, a frat, what is a critical bone defect? And basically it's a gap that prevents spontaneous healing and may require a patient to undergo additional procedures. And in all honesty, as, as Mitch mentioned at the beginning, there really is a lack of consensus on what is actually a critical bone defect in, when we're talking about incomplete cortices and, and um, 
patients who have bone loss. Uh, I think yeah. it also just extends, you know, you, you, you seem to, because of the lack of consensus, uh, my colleagues and I, I think we, we often ignore it. You delay, you delay it. You're like, yep. relax, bro. It's a seven mm -hmm. month, it's a tibia, it's gonna take. So now you're like, you've extended this patient's episode of care seven, eight months. Okay, continue. I, I don't wanna interrupt. Keep, no, no, I, and, and I agree because you, you wanna know what's gonna happen. And so the whole purpose was to quantify and review healing outcomes of open fractures. And they were looking at bone gaps that were 10 to 50 millimeters on greater than or equal to 50% of the cortical circumference. And we'll, we'll talk about what exactly that, that is um, and kind of how they measured it and, and how that relates to what, what you're gonna be doing in your practice. And the primary aim was to define what that critical bone defect was based on union, the likelihood of healing and the need for additional uh, interventions, right? So retro retrospective evaluation of almost uh, 250 patients. Uh, from 2007 to 2013. Their inclusion criteria were patients aged 18 to 65, and then any fractures, any open fractures treated definitively with IM nail. And their exclusion criteria were listed here. So pathologic injuries, pagets, uh, heterotopic ossification, periprosthetics. And we'll talk about, as I said, um, what is that bone defect or what is the uh, amount of bone loss that they included in the study? So this is what's called the radiographic apparent bone gap, and it's a measurement taken on AP and lateral radiographs where you measure the bone gaps on at all four cortices. And, and you know, when you say four cortices on a radiograph, it makes sense. When you say four cortices on a tibia, it doesn't necessarily make sense, right? Because the tibia is a triangle. Um, but, you know, on these radiographs, looking at that, bone defect, you measure it, and then you average that value. Um, you know, you divide the total by four, and that gives you what, what is considered the radiograph apparent, radiographic apparent bone gap. So they eliminated any patient who had a gap on any cortice that was greater than 50 millimeters, and any gap that was, uh, you know, less than 10 on multiple cortices, um, I'm sorry, a, a total that was less than 10. So, you know, we'll get to that. And then patients were included if, they, if that gap was at least 10 millimeters on two or more cortices, but no greater than 50, as I mentioned. This was measured by two different reviewers uh, and a Pearson correlation uh, was performed to make sure that they were symmetric and all measurements were calibrated based on the known intramedullary nail size. Primary outcome was union, and that was determined by either surgeon documentation or radiographic union showing cortical bridging on two out of four cortices with a stable implant. So, you know, we're talking about large defects, and if you're going to have large defects, you may not see cortical bridging on two of those four. So that's something to think about if they're considering that a union, right? How much pain do patients have in those situations? That's something to think about long term. Non-unions were based on physician documentation, the idea of a patient having a scheduled non-union surgery or lack of radiographic union on at least uh, two out of those four cortices at the most recent radiographic evaluation. So we talked about that. Um, and then the other thing to think about, so the, you know, the, REBG was a value, had a ROC, which was basically to determine the gap size that was most predictive of healing or the gap size where patients were more likely to develop a non-union. So here are the patient descriptive care statistics, uh, which are showing kind of the patients who had complications as well as additional fixation form. Um, there were 40 patients out of those 235 who met the exclusion criteria. And if you look at that rate, the rate of non-union in the study was 52.5%. So that's pretty high, right? If we're talking about these patients, 52.5% of them went on to non-union requiring additional surgical intervention. Of that included were one patient who went on to amputation. And, uh, and then there were seven patients who went on to infection uh, requiring intervention. 
When you look at the kind of length of the smallest cortical gap in non-union, uh, the smallest cortical gap was 20. And then if you look at the RBG, RABG for non-unions were 20. Uh, and then the largest cortical gap was 36. So that's kind of based on those measurements. So if those numbers were smaller, kind of in that rate of 11, uh, 12 and 26, you know, you're going to see a higher rate of union for these patients. There was pretty good uh, reproductive reproduct, uh, reproduction of those uh, measurements uh, with a Pearson correlation of 0.825. So that's actually very good. And so here's the ROC for the radiographic apparent bone gap. And, you know, what we learned from that is that if you look at patients who had a bone gap, a radiographic apparent bone gap less than 25%, they had a higher likelihood of healing, higher likelihood of healing. Um, when compared to those uh, who had a gap greater than uh, 20, greater than or equal to 25, they had a 0% healing rate. Um, but, you know, even in those patients with a RABG greater than or less than 25, Fifth, only 54% of those patients actually went on to union uh, without requiring additional intervention. And the highest RABG in a patient uh, achieving union was 24 millimeters. So what are some limitations, right? So they excluded patients with cortical defects greater than 50 millimeters. So that's basically saying that these patients are gonna require some different intervention, right? So that's when we're talking about early masculine, um, looking at these patients as someone who's going to need transport, transport or some other form of fixation rather than just depending on intermedullary nailing. Uh, these were patients who were all undergoing intermedullary nailing fixation only. Uh, so what is what happens in patients with those defects with plating? What is the, the likelihood of a com complication with those? And then lastly, you know, is that 50% healing rate enough? And I think that's the conversation that really needs to be had when you look at this article and kind of when you think about these patients. And as Mitch had said, you know, if you're looking at this patient for seven months and their rate of healing is going to be 50%, is that the right decision for them? Or do we proceed with some form of early intervention for these patients um, in some form of early prep uh, to prevent them from having those complications? So in conclusion, what we do know is that if that RABG is less than 25, you know, they, they reported as reasonable in their conclusions, uh, a reasonable probability of union. And, and I guess if 54% is reasonable, then I'd be worried to think about what isn't reasonable. Um, and then if the patient has an RABG greater than or equal to 25, you know, these patients are going to need uh, some form of intervention. And so maybe intramedullary nailing and watchful waiting isn't the right initial decision for them. Um, and then lastly, some perspective evaluation of fracture gaps is indicated based on this, this study. Thank you, Milton. Yeah, I, I think also it's super practical. I'm thinking about three patients already that have it. And also, what is the catastrophic failure going to look like? Obviously, if it's a periarticular fracture and then you wait and you got like 17 broken screws is, is, uh, is different than an IM nail that fails also, I think. But I, I really like this study. I think it's super practical. The group, it's a very good group. And I think the study is well designed. It, it was only open fractures, right? That was included. Only, I mean, I think it's yeah, smart, 235 uh, open fractures and then 40 that they were able to kind of who fit the criteria. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. interesting if you go back to the figure from the ROC curve, though, even though they claimed it at 25, the, the real crossover there really happens somewhere around 13, 14 millimeters, right? Because exactly. if you look below those numbers, they do pretty good. Um, and then when you look above them, not so much, you no. know, so no. that, that's probably like to me, that's probably more, I think, um, how, how I would interpret it myself as being more reasonable versus not, not in that. But uh, uh, it's a great paper though, it's good data. I mean, I, I think the thing that it, it, 
you know, I, I think one of the things that it tells me is, you know, when you see these big gaps, right, if you have this 25 millimeter gap or the 25 millimeter RABG and you have that 40 millimeter gap on one side, you know, you, you're probably going to want to put some, put some cement something. in and plan for this patient to come back and, and bone graft them. I think, you know, if you have somebody who can sit around at the house for seven months uh, and wait, then maybe they'll be fine. But most likely, most people don't want to do that. And I think the other thing that, that it reminds me of is the fact that, you know, it, it, we don't really know, and they don't discuss all of the reasons for surgical intervention. You know, I, I have patients who I can think off the top of my head who have those two or three cortices that are healed. And that single courtesy with a big gap that we didn't choose to bone graft or he didn't or they didn't want to bone graft and they can do everything they want to do. They're happy um, and they avoided that second procedure. You know, how do we distinguish these patients completely? Yeah. And also maybe it's COVID and you have no OR time. So maybe that factors into it. All right, Milton, give me the uh, give me the slide deck. I'm going to show the last slide. Um, yep. Um, so you, can pick, you can just decide to share. No, it won't let me. Uh, just stop share. share. Stop share. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, so last last slides. Upcoming sessions. I have to say the upcoming sessions are amazing. I think the next week, uh, this one is should be really, 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 really good because we have some surgeons who are really expert in both ORIF and arthroplasty. So I think it's gonna be a well-balanced uh, talk uh, next week. And of course, there's some really good ones uh, coming up. Uh, there'll be a link within 24 hours uh, to get the recording if you want to uh, check it out. We have a YouTube channel, uh, The Fireside, and there's also some really good content uh, and with AO North America. We thank you guys very, very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Little and Dr. Quinnen very much. And I encourage you guys quickly to just um, answer the poll questions. I think we'll set that up right now. So thank you guys very much and uh, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.